This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Want to know what's going on in your neck of the woods and learn the history and the people behind the events that you love across the state? Get to know the real Mississippi. Check out MPB Think Radio's Next Stop Mississippi podcast on all platforms or on the MPB public media app. Welcome to AutoCorrect, helping you correct your auto problems. Our host is Coach Charlie Melton, ASC certified master technician. I'm Jermaine Flood. Hey, Coach Charlie. How are you doing, Jermaine? I'm doing good today. It's a it's another hot Thursday, but I'm doing good on this hot Thursday. A good hot Thursday, but do you know I saw a little rain this morning in my pond? Where? Over there in Flowood, there was a little bit of rain. What? I didn't see it. I didn't see it neither until I looked out there on the pond. And, I and saw it was sprinkles. it was some sprinkles. That's all it was. I would love for it to come on down because that's the only way the, the heat's going to break. I think in the next couple <laughs> of days we may get something. Yeah, I hope so. Hopefully. I hope so. Well, we are here and we are going to be talking about oxygen sensors and catalytic converters today. Our email address for questions is auto at mpbonline.org. Now, Coach, you have an interesting story about an interesting way to have a a car wreck? Well, you know, I was thinking, I was at a meeting last night with my wife, and I was sitting around talking to all these people, and I don't know how this collision came up, but this woman told me, she says, you know, I had a wreck inside of an automatic car wash. (laughs) Well, I thought to myself, I said, well, wait a minute, your car is on a cradle. It's going in on its own. It's being operated. You're not even driving the car. You're in neutral. Yeah, you should should be in neutral. Yeah. And the vehicle, I reckon you have your air conditioner on if you want to have it running. But she rear-ended a back of a vehicle, ran into the trailer hitch. Destroy, it really messed her car up. Right. And I was thinking, I said, well, wonder if the airbag would have went off. Would the insurance totaled the car and whose fault would it have been? Would it have been the car wash? Would it have been her fault? Or the person in front of her. Yeah, the person in front of her didn't have no brake lights. <laughs> yeah, that could be. But I, like I was, I was wondering, did she take it out of neutral and put it in drive and then hit the gas or maybe the car in front of her put it in reverse <laughs> i don't know i don't know how this happened <laughs> well the the tire is cradled in a cradle right. and you have to either go over the cradle backwards or forward so most likely i think she said that the operator put her too close to the car in front of her oh okay but still, maybe it, that's a thing but still if it was in a cradle i just don't understand i don't understand so most likely knocked it out of gear and so she was upset she was upset she said they she took to the shop and had quite a bit of damage on yeah the goodness of course gracious. didn't hurt the vehicle in front of him because it hit the hitch yeah but it did hurt her car well everybody watch out inside of those things <laughs> <laughs> that hitch is the worst don't hit that with your shin either that's oh, the hitch that's the worst worst <laughs> that's true you walk around it don't oh know my it's there. goodness oh. yeah one of those yeah. things parked on a parking lot and they're backed into that you know a quick getaway parking yeah. job that everybody does, and that hitch is like halfway over the the walkway there, and you, you just be bopping along on the sidewalk, having a good day. I was like, clank. I think I need that part of my shin anyway. It's cool. I think mine sticks about out. Mine on my truck sticks out about ten inches. Yeah. Goodness yeah. gracious. Yeah, you would have tore all the way through to the engine. Would have went all the way to the engine. That's true. <laughs> You would have tore through the, to the engine, but that's a that's a I funny that story. A funny story. I, my first accident, I was driving my mom's Caprice Classic, <laughs> a tank of a vehicle. Oh yes, and uh, and a low vehicle too. And I I ran up under a a big like four by four pickup truck that under had a big it. hitch on it. That was goodness. Yeah, and it went. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because oh. it was so tall, and I was. You know, yes. low down. I got myself hooked under there really good. Right. Like it was excellent. It was excellent wreck. Right. Yeah. Now you get on front of it, start pushing down. Right. Right. <laughs> well, well, we'll talk about something else we can tear up today or <laughs> not tear it up. Oxygen sensors and catalytic converters. So I do have a definition or a couple. Automotive oxygen sensors 
colloquially known as O2 sensors make modern electronic fuel injection and emission control possible. And if an oxygen sensor fails, the engine computer won't be able to correctly set the air fuel ratio, which could result in lower fuel fuel economy, higher emissions and damage to other components, such as an overheated catalytic converter. That is a good explanation. Okay. But I will tell you, auction <laughs> sensors and uh, auction sensors and count converters started being put on vehicles in 1975. Okay. Okay. And what they were doing when we started to change the emissions, they had to be able to read the emissions in order to tell the computers, when we started getting the computers, to tell the computers how much fuel is going to go in those vehicles. Oh, that's why it was birthed. It was birthed out of emission control. Out of emission control. Oh, okay. Well, come on now, catalytic converters. And every time I hear catalytic, I always think Cadillac, even though it's not that, and it's not spelled the same way. But. Well, if you think about catalytic converters, you know, you hear in the news, people are stealing them all the time. Well, there's a reason they're stealing them because of the precious metals that are in them that are in each converter. It's palladium and platinum. Oh, okay. I was going to think copper, but no. no. It's very expensive metals oh, and rare metals, like okay. I said, palladium and platinum. Platinum's about twelve to $1,300 an ounce, and it's been as high as $2,000 an ounce. And palladium's about $1,000 an ounce right now. Eight, oh, wow. $1,000 an ounce. So everybody's got a piece of platinum and didn't even really think about it. Didn't even know it. Oh, could okay. I'm I'm going off rail right now, <laughs> no, Jay. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't pull that thing out from underneath your car. I'm going. Yeah, that's where I was going. And then let's just say, if you have an old vehicle, could you turn that into something? Could you turn that catalytic converter? Let's just say in a jewelry. <laughs> that's if, where I was going with that. If you knew how to recycle it, because you know all the emissions go through that catalytic converter, so you'd have to learn how to recycle it. It had to be clean. Oh uh, yeah. It's a lot of it's a big process of getting it all out. Okay. But it's worth it. Okay. 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 All right. We are not taking catalytic converters off of our vehicles, but we're no. going to learn all about them today. That's right. And also oxygen senses, uh, sensors today as well. But we're going to head to the phones. We've got Bob in Hattiesburg on the line. Um, Bob, you are on. He called about his AC a few weeks ago, Coach. Well, here's the update. Bob, you're on with Coach Charlie. All right. Uh, Coach Charlie, uh, y'all, thanks for taking my call about three weeks ago. I called with an air condition problem, and I went through my owner's manual, and I checked, and you told me at the time it may it probably sounds like a relay. All right, this re- relay that controlled the AC wouldn't work, the heater wouldn't work, the defroster wouldn't work, nothing would work, the air condition uh, compressor would not turn and lock up the clutch, and and I. I was troubleshooting it in this manual, and this is what it was. It was a a blower motor relay, which prevented any of these other items from working on the vehicle. That's right. Which is is, uh, troubleshooting is really misleading because it says blower motor. It don't say nothing about air condition. But anyway, I I was busy working on some appliances at the house. And you told me I probably checked pull out the relay, and that turned out to be what it was when I went to the Ford place. I told them it's a relay, so evidently they knew not to um, give me some crap about overcharging me with telling me something else. Well, that's great. But, but it turned out that's what it was. It is not uh, controlled by a fuse. It's only a, a blower motor relay, which controls the air condition, defrost, heater or anything, but my all my dashboard lights lit up as if it was going to work, but nothing. And I sure appreciate you taking my call and giving me the information. And I started to pull out them relays, but like I say, I was working on a washing, washing machine and dryer, and their instruction troubleshooting the same thing. Everything they tell you is misleading to what the real problem is. So well, it took me a while to solve all that. Well, you, you know, I always say keep it simple first. There is a fuse that controls that relay. Uh, yeah. If the fuse is not blown, then the next thing is a relay. Uh, I told somebody today their fan blower motor is coming on and off when he hits a bump. Well, yeah. either 
the relay itself is stuck, and when he hits the bump, it the contacts come apart, so or come yeah. together, or he has a bad blower motor. But he's going to have to bring it over to me to check it out because he can't do it. But anyway, mm. that's one of those things you always keep it simple, stupid, and that's exactly what you did. Great, great job. Right. Hey, uh, Charlie. Yes, sir. Uh, the manual I'm looking at right now is not controlled by a fuse. There's a lot of most everything else is. But this blower motor and several other items are not controlled by fuse so, listed in the book. So it's going strictly to the relay itself? Yeah. Oh, good. All right. Okay, thank you. Y'all have a good day, and I appreciate the show. Thank you. Bob, thank you. We appreciate you. Coach, you always know how to figure it out, and then they call you back, and then they tell you good news like that. So well, That's good. And that, you know, that's what we're here for is just, uh, you know, our slogan is that we're going to steer you in the right direction. Right. And that's what we want to do. Yeah. And you did that. You did that. So I'm going to piggyback off of Bob. We've got an email dealing with air conditioner. This is coming from Jay, not our Jay, but another Jay. And he says, I was driving my 1999 Camry Toyota Tuesday and was running my air conditioner when I stopped at a red light. It went dead, and then again, a short time later, it went dead while I was sitting at a stop sign. Both times, I just started it up and drove off. After the stop sign incident, when I turned the air conditioner off, um, once I did that, it did not die again. What is going on with the car? <clears throat> is it my air conditioner? And what should I do about it before summer arrives? But <laughs> summer's here, so it came really fast. <laughs> Well, you know, what what it sounds like is happening to me is that when he cuts the air conditioner on, it has a clutch, electronic clutch on the front, an electro- electromagnet. And that clutch pulls in and it takes power from the engine itself. Okay. So if, it, if that clutch is maybe bad and it's pulling, it's drawing so much amperage, it will kill the car. Okay. So you want to make sure it could be locking up. And by locking up, it could be the belt could be grabbing on Mm -hmm. it where it cannot turn Mm -hmm. and that'll kill the car as well so when he cuts his air conditioner off and there's no power to the air conditioner that means that clutch can't come in and out and as as long as it's freewheeling that means that the air conditioner is not working and just the outside's turning Mm -hmm. but once you put that clutch in that means that the inside of that air conditioner is turning and it could be locking up Oh, okay. So because he's running the air, it stays running? The uh, yeah, No, because he has the air off, mm-hmm. it, it stays, stays running. running. When he cuts the air on, it does not run. So it's not the air conditioner itself? It could be the clutch on the, on the or the compressor on the uh, air, AC itself. Okay. The compressor. Okay. Well, Jay, not our Jay, but that Jay, I hope that helps. So I wanted to make sure I got that in since we were piggybacking off well, that know, AC question. Well, you there's a lot of times that you can start <clears throat> looking at a vehicle and trying to understand what is causing the problem when you start cutting things off. Okay. And then you can go from there. Okay, perfect. Mm-hmm. If you've got a question, send your emails to auto at mpbonline.org. We're talking about oxygen sensors and catalytic converters. Is your car under recall? I'll tell you how you can find out next. You're listening to AutoCorrect with Coach Charlie Melton. I'm Jermaine Flood. If you want even more AutoCorrect, find our podcast on all podcast platforms for your smart device. AutoCorrect is heard on MPB Think Radio Thursdays at 10 a.m. with a replay Saturdays at 11 a.m. Well, heels, here are some recent recalls. 43,000 Toyota Lexus vehicles are recalled for the fire risk. Affected vehicles include model year 21, um, 2021 to 2022 Toyota RAV4 Prime SUVs and model year 2022 Lexus NX450H Plus SUVs. The issue is with the DC-DC converter, which may not convert electricity voltage properly and experience a short circuit. As a result of the excessive heat generated by that short circuit, there's an increased risk risk of fire for that vehicle. To resolve the issue, Toyota and Lexus will inspect and replace the DC-DC converter as necessary for free. For more information, you can contact Toyota. And finally, Toyota Lexus recalls 110,000 vehicles over airbags. 
So not <laughs> right. Not only do you have fire risk, but now you have airbag risk. Um, and this um, affected vehicles include Toyota model years 2023 Corolla sedans, Corolla Cross, Corolla Cross Hybrid, Highlander and Highlander Hybrid SUVs and Tacoma pickup trucks. Model year 2023 RX and RX Hybrid SUVs, as well as model year 2024 NX and NX Hybrid SUVs from Lux from Toyota's luxury brand. And Lexus are also affected. The issue is with a spiral cable assembly located in the steering column, which may lose its electrical. Oh, I can't get it out now. Which may lose its electrical connection with the driver's airbag. As a result, the airbag warning light will illuminate, but the airbag may not deploy in the crash, increasing the risk of injury. Um, to resolve the problem, Toyota is advising owners of involved vehicles to visit a local dealer for replacement of the spiral cable as necessary for free. And those with more questions can contact Toyota. You can find out if your car has a past recall by going to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's website, nhtsa.gov forward slash recalls and inputting your VIN, or you can find their Safer Car app. And today we're talking about oxygen sensors and catalytic converters. We're also taking your vehicle repair questions. Our email address is auto at mpbonline.org. Coach, we've got a Bob on the line in Starkville, he has a catalytic converter and O2 issues well, right on time. Talk about it. Bob, you're on with Coach Charlie. Hey, I appreciate taking the call. So um, I, uh, my son has a, a car he's just driving to college, and um, in Georgia, he um, he has to have the emissions checked every every year. So in order to get it, this um, 2002 Honda CRV, I had to replace the catalytic converter from the uh, from the, when the manufacturer installed it. It was really easy to remove it. I put a new one in and used the old um, O2 sensors. Well, it went, um, the engine light, or the, yeah, the engine light came on a couple weeks ago. And so I have the Honda here in Starkville. I'm taking the uh, catalytic converter back out. However, one of the O2 sensors, I can't get it out. And um, I have a a O2 sensor removal tool. I put a clamp around it to try to keep it from rounding the O2 sensor. I just, um, I went to go buy another one and it was $175. I guess that's an OEM one. And I began to look into um, the cost of, of uh, you know, I guess um, off-brand ones or whatever. And they're significantly cheaper, like, you know, 30 bucks. So I just wanted to know um, really, first of all, how am I going to get this thing out? Or any other recommendations? Because I need to return it so that I can, um, you know, uh, get the warranty replacement. And then the other thing is the O2 sensor side. You know, it's the front sensor. I guess it's the upstream. Anyway, any ideas else how to get it out? Yeah, what happens, those oxygen sensors, they rust up in there, and they're very hard to get out on certain ones. Uh, the wrench that you have, is it a socket that you can put on that you can get a longer pri uh, longer bar, uh, bar handle on there in order to get it out, or is there any room up there at all? Yeah, yeah, and it has a, a split down it, and so, you know, I was trying to figure out how to get it out, and I saw somebody who used it in a YouTube video, they used a hose clamp, a steel hose clamp, I put that on it, but it broke the hose clamp. I've never um, done it with a hose clamp. I've, what about I've done it with a pipe wrench? If you can get a pipe wrench in there and get on those thread, um, get on that uh, place where the wrench goes, that socket, okay. you can get it out. Like I say, it's just I tight in there. If you get a pipe wrench and you get enough leverage on it, it'll move, and it'll okay. move where you'll be able to take it out with your hand. But now let me explain to you on O2 sensors. O2 sensors, you have upstreams and you have downstreams. The upstreams control the engine itself. The downstreams only control to tell the computer about the catalytic converter. That's the, that's all the downstreams do. Okay. A lot of times you can get a lot of false readings on oxygen sensors because there are other things wrong with the engine. When the oxygen sensor light comes on, just say if the um, oxygen sensor comes on, you may have a lean or a rich code inside the computer. And you need to figure out what is causing it to be rich or lean. 
Now, you can have lazy auction sensors, and that just means they're not switching this quick in order for the computer to read it. And then you have some that are just dead. But what happens a lot of time with auction sensors, they get contaminated. Uh, either you had an oil leak or antifreeze or something got on that auction sensor will contaminate that auction sensor, and it will not read correctly. Mm. But I would think that if you can get the a pipe wrench on that auction sensor, you'll be able to get that out. And then, like I say, that catalytic, catalytic converter, how long ago did you put it on? March. It's oh, only yeah. four months old. Yeah, they they'll warranty that quickly, but then they're gonna say, "Well, how do you know it's the how do you know it's the catalytic converter?" Just hope they don't come up with that question for you. Well, yeah, I had to take it to a shop um, because they wouldn't replace it unless I gave them a report from a mechanic, and they told they and so the mechanic wrote it up that it was a uh, catalytic converter. But you know, I don't I don't know that it's not the O2. I just you know, I, it's all I don't know what it is. I always, if I was going to do a catalytic converter, I would put at least the back two auction sensors in at the same time because they're both downstream and that they control the, they don't really control it, but what they're doing, they're telling the computer how well the catalytic converter is working. That's exactly what they're for. You know, so you would replace them both? I would always replace the back two because if there was something wrong with the catalytic converter and... Maybe it wasn't the catalytic converter. Maybe it is those oxygen sensors. Usually I would just go ahead and I replace them as well. And then what you could do there, you talk about the OEM and the aftermarket. Just make sure right. you get a Bosch or a Nipodenso because those are usually what comes with them, and they're usually good oxygen sensors. Mm -hmm. Say the name of that again, please. Uh, Nenso or uh, Nip one's called uh, Nipodenso, and then just uh, NESE, I do believe, is the other one. Okay. And then you can do a Bosch. All those are good auction sensors. Okay. I appreciate that. That's that's what I was going to do is get a, uh, get a couple more, but the, it's $175 for OEM, and it seems like it's 25 bucks for, um, you know, aftermarket. Mm. All right. Well, like I said, just make sure you don't contaminate it. Make, it usually comes with some graphite to put on the threads to put it back in that exhaust pipe. Okay. All right. I appreciate your uh, appreciate your advice. Mm -hmm. uh, I got a pipe wrench. I'm gonna. I'll try it. Thank you. You can get to it. Yes, sir. Bob, thank you for giving us a call, Coach. You did it again, and this time it was with oxygen sensors and catalytic. <laughs> That's what we're working on. That's what we're talking about. Right. So I want to stay on that. We've got um, email mystery engine surge email coming from Whiskers. Whisker says, hello, coach. I own a 2002 Toyota V6, um, new with uh, 245,000 miles, um, since new with 245,000 miles. Engine light came on, replaced upper oxygen sensor, engine light went off. Shortly after, surging started once truck warmed, no engine light, then replaced mass air flow sensor, still surging, no engine light replace PVC. Surging continued, no engine light. Checked fuel pump pressure and replaced fuel filter. Surging continued, no engine light. Checked for air leaks. Surging continued, no engine light. Once started, idle is smooth until warm. What's next? Great show. Okay. When you start having a surge, it sounds like to me a vacuum leak somewhere. Um, it could be a around the manifold itself. It could be a small hose. It could be in the brake booster. I would look for a vacuum leak because what happens, that will make that engine surge. And you can throw parts at it all day long, but you need to really find the problem before you start throwing more money into it because, you know, it's a 2002. Uh, there's a way that you can uh, find a vacuum leak. First of all, you can listen. It makes a hissing sound, just mm -hmm. pssst. You will hear that sound, okay, if it's loud. And the next thing you could do is take you some carburetor cleaner and spray around that manifold. And once uh, that uh, carburetor cleaner goes into that engine, that engine will smooth out and it'll quit surging. And then, you know, you have the vacuum leak found. Okay. Whiskers, I hope that helped. 245,000 miles. Whiskers is holding on. He's holding on to that car. That's it. <laughs> holding on to that car. 
Whiskers is holding on to that car. Our email address where you can send questions is auto at mpbonline.org. We're talking about oxygen sensors and catalytic converters between your car repair questions. What's in the news? Mississippi, unfortunately, has the deadliest roads in the U.S., a study has revealed. And I'll tell you more about that next. Thank you for listening to AutoCorrect on MPB Think Radio. Coach Charlie Melton, retired instructor from Clinton High School's Automotive Technology Program, is our expert host. I'm Jermaine Flood. I hope you downloaded our app for your smartphone, the MPB Public Media app. In addition to listening to our show on the app, you can click on the support button and make a contribution. You can click on the Talk to Us Now button and talk to Coach Charlie if you have a question. And contributions help keep our programs on the air for you and others to enjoy. And we thank you for your contribution to Mississippi Public Broadcasting. Autocorrect is heard on MPB Think Radio Thursdays at 10 a.m. with a replay Saturdays at 11 a.m. Okay, Coach, here we go. Mississippi has the deadliest roads in the U.S. a study has revealed. And the highest rate of fatal car crashes with 26 Point two deaths per 1,000 population. So here's two behind us. South Carolina and Arkansas have the second and third highest fatalities, respectively. And Rhode Island is home to the safest roads. So if you want to be safe on the road, you're going to have to move to... <laughs> well, they don't drive much if they're the uh, In Rhode Island? <laughs> they ride a lot. So they have the safest roads in the U.S. with only 5.7 fatal car crash deaths per 1,000 of the population. But Mississippi has been named the most dangerous U.S. state for fatal car crashes. So um, Mississippi takes that first place, regrettably, um, as the most uh, dangerous one in the U.S., but the most dangerous intersection in Mississippi, I don't know where this is, Jay, he's our Atlas guy, right? So the most dangerous intersection in Mississippi is Airways Boulevard and Goodman Road. South Haven. That's South Haven. Yeah. I, was, I was actually going to say Goodman Road in South Haven. Yeah, that was South going to be my guess. That or Hardy oh, Street. Oh, you were going to guess that? Yep. Oh, okay. And then Horn Lakes? That's up there. It's that's same, the same place? I mean, it's DeSoto that's County. A, that's the fastest County. growing place in the state. It's the same place. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's the most uh, dangerous intersection in Mississippi. Airways, Boulevard, and Goodman Road, Horn Lakes. That's what they're calling that. And while the most dangerous highways are U.S. Highway 61 and I-20. Well, try driving down and you'll see why the danger is because potholes and uh, the roads not paved, they're bad. Yeah. Yeah. So those those two spots on the highway, 61 and I-20, are the worst. That's wild that it wouldn't be 55, one of the most major highways, that it's... It's our it's our cross highway. And well, yeah, not, they've done so much work on I fifty five. It's our east to west highway. But so much work has been done on there. The roads are smooth, but I twenty is a terrible highway <laughs> to drive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. a bad highway to it's be just, on. It's just you know it's not maintained. Mm, mm, mm. I know we could talk about this all the time. They're saying that one possible reason though for the high ranking may be the state's low seat belt usage. Um, so the national use of seat belts in the U.S. is 91.6%, but in Mississippi, the number is only 77.9%. And other contributing factors may include frequent congestion on roads not designed for high speed, a lack of infrastructure funding, and dangerous driving. All, yeah. that, all that's involved, and hopefully we can get safer. Right, 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 right. So fatal motor vehicle accidents by state um, because of our population with 2,949,586 fatal car crashes are 697 deaths, 772, and deaths per that 100,000 population, 26.2. So this is coming from the Zinda Law Group, um, and I'll have a link to this story. So. Right. Unfortunately, we are the highest there. But today we're talking about oxygen sensors and catalytic converters. Email your questions to auto at mpbonline.org. Okay, Coach, we've got a couple of phone calls on the line, but I wanted to talk about the upper and lower oxygen sensors that you were going to mention before we hit those phone calls. Well, when you think about oxygen sensors, the upper or upstream oxygen sensors, that is what 
reads the engine. That is what tells the computer, I need this much uh, fuel. I'm going this fast. This is what those oxygen sensors do. They're going to tell you if you're lean, and lean means that you are got too much air, mm-hmm. and rich means you got too much fuel. So it sort of reads that. It's trying to stay on a scale, you know, because those oxygen sensors, they're – the maximum is like uh, less than a volt is what they put out. And right. they read from that voltage up and down. And they're constantly switching. So those two, the upper control, the engine and the computer, the lower controls the oxygen, the catalytic converter itself is reading how much oxygen is coming out of the catalytic converter. Because the thing is, really, all the oxygen in the catalytic converter is supposed to be burnt. Mm-hmm. And so it's reading how much oxygen is coming out of that catalytic converter. And you can test that if you had an infrared uh, thermostat. And you could test that, a gun, by the front of the catalytic converter should be about 100 degrees cooler than the back of the catalytic converter. Because mm. we always know if you more air you put in, hotter it gets. Right, right. And so think about how that works. <laughs> Make sure you check in that. Please make sure you are checking that. So you want to make sure when somebody says, well, you need all four oxygen sensors. Well, do you really need all four oxygen sensors? Because only the front two control the engine. Okay. Okay. Back to uh, talk about the gallic converter itself. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, Coach, you know. (laughs) Thanks for clearing that up. We're going to go to the phone lines. We've got Greg calling from South Alabama. Greg, you're on with Coach Charlie. Hey, Coach. Uh, quick question. I have a Sienna minivan, an 08 one, and recently we realized that we have water uh, uh, flowing in from the back, like, door. The door seems to shut and seal and all of that, and, you know, and I was wondering if you had any advice about why water might be getting in. Apparently, minivans are pretty notorious for water leaks. I was wondering if you had any ideas. Let me ask you a question. Does it happen when you're using the air conditioner all the time? or does uh, so, so I have drained or I, I have shop backed out the air conditioning plug because that was one of the first things that I read about, that those get clogged with just gunk and slime just like your air conditioner at your house does. Right. And, and, and so I did shop vac out uh, the drain for the A.C., that runs to the back of the car. Um, so I did that. And then one other suggestion I had was that it's possible that the, I guess, the gasket around your brake light that's like at the top of your car right. on the outside, uh, that that gasket or something can dry rot over time since it's an 08 and it's 15 years old, that, that that's a possibility and that water can uh, get in that way. I was wondering if you had any other ideas. Well, and you want to check the light itself too, make sure that you don't have cracks in the light itself because okay. you know, check it, make sure you don't have no water in those lights because that's another way. But usually it's going to come around the, either the gasket itself, open the uh, side door, open the hatch on the back and make sure that the, the gasket itself is tight or there's no cracks in that gasket. Uh, because a lot of times it, where it seals and closes completely, if that gasket is bad, water will get in it. And it takes a drive in rain in order for it yeah. to get in. And so it looks like, you know, I, I checked that thing, you know, that might be the, you know, the first thing, you know, and it kind of like a fridge or whatever. It looks good. It looks like it's attached that, uh, and it's not crunchy or anything that I could find where it might not be, uh, you know, c- you know, in in bad shape in some way, and it doesn't appear to be that way. So that's why I was wondering if you had any other suggestions. Have you did a water test on it? Uh, just like like me getting a hose and just running water all over it kind yes. of thing? just let it sit there and let the water run beside the door and those lights. Since you got all the water out of it, then that will show you where that water is coming in. Okay. Yeah, kind of like for, a roo- uh, for the roof of your house kind of thing if you're looking. Yes, sir. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. That, that's like the one thing I haven't done. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, mm-hmm. too, Greg. Thank right. you for giving us a call. We're going to stay on the phone lines. We've got Willie in Vidalia. Willie, you are on with Coach Charlie. I got a 2011 Silver Lake Silver Auto Tech Edition. When I have the air conditioning, I'm going to be traveling on the highway when it be real hot, the sun be shining under the windshield. It'd be kind of like the, out of the vent. It starts to see like steam be coming out of there. What caused that? You saw what things like steam is coming out of the vent? Coming out of the vent when the air conditioning running. Okay, so it looks like a mist coming out. Is it cold? Oh, it's 
cold now. Okay, so what it's doing, it's it's really what it's doing. It's the condensation that's coming. You may have some condensation in those vents itself, and it's pushing that that cold air is hitting that condensation and pushing it out. If it's cold, I wouldn't worry about it because uh, you see a lot of vehicles. That just means that that temperature is getting way down, and you're okay. Okay, so it don't do it that often, but it, when sometimes it be some hot. Do it. It yeah, it's just where that air conditioner, you have some condensation down in there, and that blower motor and that fan's just blowing it out. All right. I can appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Willie, for giving us a call. Coach, you always know how to make it work. That's right. <laughs> you always know how to make it work. Coach, I wanted to ask you a question about maintaining catalytic converters. Is there a way that you can maintain them? There's nothing that you can do to a catalytic converter. To maintain it. To maintain it whatsoever. Just make sure that you have good fuel that you're putting in your vehicle, and there's really nothing you could do because what happens, the metals, if you look at an oxygen sensor, it's like a honeycomb on the inside of Mm -hmm. it, and all that emissions go through it, and it just sort of travels, and as it's going through that honeycomb, those different elements mix with it, and it, it clings to those different elements will cling. Okay. The exhaust itself clings to it, okay. and they do get stopped up. And that's why most manufacturers OEM are eighty thousand to one hundred twenty thousand mile warranties mm-hmm. on. Them. Okay, so that's and like I say, they they're going to last. Now I want you to understand. A lot of people don't understand this. If your catalytic converter is under warranty, mm-hmm. there are other emission controls that are under warranty as well for that same amount of time. So you need to look in your owner's manual and it will tell you all the emission parts because the emission parts on that new vehicle has a much longer warranty than the 36,000 mile warranty. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So you want to look at that. Make sure you stay on top of yeah, that. Anything emission related, it could be the oxygen sensors, it could be the catalytic converter, mm-hmm. it could be uh, the ma- uh, mass airflow sensor, anything that deals with emission, the EGR valve, mm-hmm. all of that's emission, the EVAMP system, it has a longer warranty than uh, regular things on your car. Okay. Okay. Well, that sounds great. That sounds great. We're going to go to the phone lines again. We've got John and Madison. John, you are on with Coach Charlie. Coach Charlie, good morning. Love your show, man. Well, thank you. Uh, Coach, I got a 2014 uh, GMC Sierra that I just bought. Um, and uh, uh, it misfire. It has a misfire on cylinder one. And we changed the spark blocks on that cylinder and the wire. Uh, I still have that, uh, that uh, um, the engine light flashing, and uh, I can feel it. It does not have that much power, you know what I mean? Right, and that's you only have a misfire in that one particular engine and that one cylinder. Yes, sir. Okay, so what I would do? Uh, did you get a new spark plug wire? Because a 2014, it doesn't have coils on it, or it just has spark plug wires. It's got the coil on it. Okay, did you get one from a aftermarket, or did you get it from the OEM, the dealer? I just went. To, I just went to the. Um O'Reilly, and they put the uh, VIN number and all that, and they gave me what info for that. Okay, what? Okay, what I would do is go back, take the coil back, and tell them that it's bad. You know, and they would tell them that it needed to replace the coil because you can get a lot of bad coils. Because what happens? They're supposed to, you know, they can't. Most of them come from China. Uh, these coils or India, so they're really not made up to for American specs like they should be. But for that particular vehicle, GM is bad for that. Getting aftermarket coils, sometimes they do not work, you know, because it has to, you need to make sure. Because if it was going, if it was other cylinders that were misfiring on that bank, you'd have another problem. But if it's just that one cylinder, how many miles that vehicle got on it? Got one ninety five thousand. Yeah, one hundred ninety five thousand. You shouldn't really have much problem with that with that coil and that plug. But I would go ahead and take the take the plug back out of it. Look at it. Make sure it's not black. Make sure it's not running rich in that cylinder. Because, like I said, the other thing that you might want to look at, and if it's running rich, check that injector. Injector. Yeah, that's the fuel injector. It's, there's one. You got the spark plug and the coil, and then right underneath it or above it, you'll have a fuel injector. Okay, Uh I would check that and see if that fuel injector is if that one injector may be stuck or something like that. What I would do to make the easy, simple, just go get you some sea foam, put in the fuel system and clean that fuel system and see if that'll clean that injector up if it's dirty. 
uh, the tea foam is for the fuel, uh, coach? Yeah, you can put it in the fuel tank. And that'll. And if those injectors are dirty, it'll clean them up. So when you're talking about the coil, you're talking about the coil, not the wire, right? No, I'm not talking about the wire. I'm talking about the coil that goes, if, if they're coil on plug, it's called COP. Each yeah. cylinder should have a coil. If not, they have spark plug wires. Yeah, they, they, did, they did switch the coil from from uh, uh, three to one. I still have misfire on it. Okay, I would if you still have a misfire, if you change the coral, I would go ahead and uh, check that fuel injector. Go ahead and get you some uh, sea foam put in there and see if that helps it. I will do that. Okay. Do that. Thank mm-hmm. you so much. Thank, thank you so much. Again, thank you. John, yes, John, thank you. We're discussing oxygen sensors and catalytic converters and taking your repair questions. You can send us an email to auto at mpbonline.org. We've got a new car review from Casey Williams coming up in Coach's Tip of the Week. This is AutoCorrect on MPB Think Radio. This week we're driving a very special version of the 2023 Jeep Grand Cherokee. It's the Trailhawk 4XC. The stripe on the hood tells you it's the Trailhawk. That means it's got the air suspension, it can raise up, it's the extreme off-road capable. But it can also ride very comfortably on the highway. It's a very nice balanced vehicle. The blue tow hooks on the front tell you this is the plug-in hybrid version of the 4XC. So you can plug in in about three and a half hours, fully recharge the batteries, and you can drive 25 miles on the back electric charge. But it also has a two liter turbocharged four cylinder engine. So you've got plenty of power and plenty of range to go and drive it on the highway and drive cross country if you want to. In fact, it's got 375 horsepower and 470 pound feet of torque. So it's a peppy little vehicle. But I really, really like driving it. You know, it's inside, it's all Jeep Grand Cherokee. You got the leather seats, touch screen, very comfortable. So let's talk about price. Well, the Grand Cherokee starts right at $40,000. This one all in, $72,630. This is AutoCorrect. If you missed any of our program, you can listen to the whole show from autocorrect.mpbonline.org. AutoCorrect is heard on MPB Think Radio Thursdays at 10 a.m. with a replay Saturdays at 11 a.m. Stay tuned after the show at 11 a.m. at Southern Ribbony Kids and Teens. I'm Jermaine Flood, and our expert is Coach Charlie Melton, ASC Certified Master Technician. It's time for Coach Charlie's Tip of the Week. Well, you know, we're talking about uh, oxygen sensors and catalytic converters. I do want to make sure that you know exactly which oxygen sensor that you need and which catalytic converter. If the catalytic converter is bad, make sure you do your research. And like I say, sometimes the OEMs can cost you a lot more money than the aftermarket. Just make sure you get a good one if you're replacing them. Uh, make sure you are looking at that because let me tell you, there's platinum off in them there thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Straight jewelry in your car. That's right. <laughs> and that makes me now want to, you know, put my car in a car garage and lock it up somehow. But now there are ways that you can protect that catalytic converter <laughs> for getting uh, from somebody stealing it. Okay. A lot of manufacturers are now putting a cover over it uh, that is a metal cover where they can't get it down from the car because a lot of times it's just sitting there. So a lot of people or it's now easy to pull. Are, yeah, a lot of people now are just putting covers over them. Okay. Okay, and attaching it to the car itself. Yeah. So when they cut the exhaust pipe in the front and in the rear, the catalytic converter don't fall down. And oh. they, don't, they can't get it. All they did was cut the pipe and now the catalytic converter is still in there. Can we do that cage thing after market? Sure. Oh, okay. And, okay. And that's what I'm saying. A lot of people are doing that now or just putting that cage over it. Yeah. You know, if you go in sometimes bad neighborhoods, they put that cage over the air conditioner. Right. It's the same thing. Oh, it's the same there. cage. So, Coach, are they going to use that cage on those lights on the interstate that they keep taking? Do you know? They take the copper. Copper out of them. Yeah, they take the copper out of those. Well, they do that at the bottom, so I don't <laughs> know how they would do that. But they are going to, you can get something aftermarket in order to help protect that catalytic converter, or you can always go to the muffler shop and they can build you something to keep that catalytic converter open. Okay. Well, we've learned all about it today, all about oxygen sensors and catalytic converters, and that'll wrap us up. Our crew engineer, Jay White, call screener Liz Gill for Coach Charlie Melton, Master Technician. I'm Jermaine Flood, episode host. (laughs) Thanks for listening to AutoCorrect on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB. Public Radio app. To-